Excellent, very good. Thanks all for joining. Look, I have no doubt that this is going to be a, a really fascinating panel. It's, it's, it's a great topic and we've got a, a, a wonderful uh, set of, of panelists here with me. So, um, in many ways, I think that the title of today's session says it all, right? Building synergies between FI and fintechs. I think that showcases that as an industry, we have already moved on from the friend or foe discussion that was going on for the last couple of years, right? RFIs and fintechs, friend or foes. That, that discussion, I believe, is closed. Everybody now recognizes that it is about partnership. It is about collaboration, particularly when you want to get a financial inclusion in the ASEAN market, right, where both parties really need to come together. So, so without further ado, let, let's, let's hand it over to, to the panelists and, 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 and Kun Chartri, let, let's start with you. When, when you look at Thailand, the ASEAN markets, which services you believe um, are, are most relevant for FIs and fintechs to collaborate together on? The important trends that are moving uh, in Thailand and in the region is the uh, urbanization, the regionalization, and the digitalization. And the, uh, I think the effect of the regionalization uh, has led to increase in trade flow, increase in investment, and also travel, which also bring many opportunities as well as challenges to come in the urbanization the same way with the increase in level of capital income uh, and so forth, the lifestyle change and then requirement from the uh, digital, uh, from, from the different opportunities also increase. And the digitalization is affect every uh, industry and especially in the uh, banking side. So first we look at this and we look at the change that is emerging in uh, five areas in the transaction banking, which is uh, on the business banking side, uh, especially on the SME, uh, in the consumer digital banking and the payment side, uh, to the mid-market wealth management uh, and to the insurance side. I think the two areas that I'd like to uh, discuss today is on the uh, transaction banking. I think on the SME side, uh, with the in uh, introduction of technology, uh, there will be more ways how to help customers uh, to have greater access to the financial system uh, and do away with the existing platform that has led to difficulties like uh, with paper and information required and make it difficult for customers to access to uh, financial uh, uh, system. I think we would be seeing more and more change coming uh, uh, that make things simpler and easier by the introduction of uh, technology. Also, many of the existing systems like the traditional, conventional trade finance system uh, that would also be changing further uh, with the introduction of technology, the blockchain type, and also how to simplify and make things easier, uh, which including the information that could be shared and then would also have greater access to the uh, financial credit. On the consumer uh, banking side, especially on the payment, many of the initiative that has been taken, both from the uh, technology side, the banking side, as well as a push from the regulator, uh, including the application of new technology like the QR code and uh, other form of payment to make it instant and s simplify as well as to make it uh, accessible at low cost or almost no cost. Uh, that also has changing the system in, uh, in a significant manner. So these are things that we see uh, happening and changing quite fast and uh, the banking players also have to adjust themselves accordingly including Bangkok Bank. Thank you. Certainly a, a fascinating set of, of trends playing out, right? So who's to our Tito for, right, friends? Um, when, when we look at the underbank, underserved in, in ASEAN, which, which products and services come to mind where you see the most obvious synergies between a bank like Union Bank and fintech players in the Philippines market? Well, um, I guess as a general strategic framework, we 
look at the symbiotic convergence, not only between fintechs and the bank, but even with tech companies, with technology companies. And we look for commonalities where we can actually find collaboration. But with regards to that specific issue of the underserved, we're focusing more on the SME uh, business and the fintech uh, value proposition is principally in the areas of payments, uh, in the area of onboarding, in the, uh, in the area of, um, of uh, alternative credit scoring, and possibly financing at a limited scale because they don't have the balance sheet. And our specific uh, contribution to that in a collaborative endeavor is the, the counter space, not specifically our branches, but because we have a dedicated uh, strat strategic initiative in that area of the mass market. So we've built, we've bought uh, counters. Uh, one is a existing remittance service. As you know, Philippines has a huge overseas remittance. So that has about 2,800 counters. And they're in the right locations, which our branches are not. Our branches are usually in urban areas and, and high-density rural areas. And we have uh, invested in an aggregator of counters that has 15,000 counters. So the counter space, although they're digital KYC, uh, the digital, the datacom infrastructure doesn't work very well and we don't have a national ID system. So the counters also help in doing the physical KYC, but the most important value proposition is the ramp on and ramp off. So this money, the cash that's in these rural areas need to get into their wallets and they need to do that physically through the counter. Once they're in the wallet, then the FinTech customer experience could be superior. And the fintechs are also not connected to the payment infrastructure of the banking system. So one of the biggest uh, so asks when we collaborate with fintechs is the, uh, to have like a debit card, this time to, to ramp off from the wallet. So cash is still a big part of the economy. That hasn't changed and probably will not for a long time. And the collaboration is in those areas right now. They also have better um, alternative scoring uh, models that are being tested that we're not yet embracing. So it's good that they're initially facing the customer with those alternative uh, credit scoring models and small ticket financing, which is important. Because at the end of the day, the the financial inclusion question cannot end simply with opening a bank account. The dormancy rates are really high, and that does not really define inclusivity or, or, or prosperity in an inclusive society. The key ingredient would be lending credit so that they can put up businesses so that they can actually invest in their, in their livelihood. So I think that's where the fintechs add value. Um, and we're working both with lo local fintechs and with uh, uh, global fintechs on that, that part of uh, doing the risk assessment. The collection problem, so after you've given the loan, you have to collect it. And that, again, is where the counters become of value. So I think every um, sort of execution needs to be thought through. It's not one size fits all. And I think the ones that we're working on have these elements where we still provide the counter space, we provide the regulatory oversight as a banking institution where the lending, we have the balance sheet, but they don't have the balance sheet, but they have the credit, uh, 
scoring systems, the alternative credit scoring system, and we have the collection uh, capabilities. So we feel that lending is really the main uh, sort of banking product that will make the difference. Very good. Look, the answer clearly is not one size fits all. For one, I think you heard just now that there is right, a vast difference in local infrastructure when you go from the Philippines to Thailand to here in Singapore and when you hear right, Ravi Manon talk about this morning about uh, some of the infrastructure that's been built here that is still lagging in the other countries. So, so, so yes, um, it, it, it is going to be dependent on every market. You have large fintech, you have small fintech, you have global tech. Um, so there needs to be different partnership models across right, different groups of constituents. So, so come on. When, when, when you look at the work you're doing um, in Attica uh, in terms of partnering with startups in particular, mm -hmm. how do you make that collaboration work when a large established player partners with a, a startup? Well, uh, we listen to as many uh, fintech or insure tech uh, that comes to us. Uh, but overall, uh, we can group uh, the people that we talk to into the wearable type of uh, technology that can help us to gauge our customers' needs better. Uh, we also look into telematics type of uh, technology. So that's really tracking the driving behavior and uh, especially for the younger uh, drivers. And uh, we also look into uh, in a comparative side, aggregator type of uh, technology. But for the most part, the, the ones that have, been, uh, that have gained some traction are really the telematics, uh, but still to a small extent. Uh, the aggregators, the comparison side are quite popular with the customers. So there's something in it for the customers and that's why it's gaining traction. But of course then again, you know, uh, we are typically one of a few others. Uh, we've also got uh, Gai, Jija, Gaiga Cover here, where we sell the, uh, the gig economy uh, coverage for gig economy um, workers, yeah? like the, the uh, ride-sharing drivers and so on. So where we cover the, uh, you know, when, when, if they're hospitalized, then we cover their income uh, while they're hospitalized. And, uh, and uh, if, uh, you know, they get uh, to be permanently disabled, then uh, there's a certain amount that you know uh, payable to them. So typically, uh, we listen to people who have uh, allow us to reach out to customers better, as well as uh, catering to specific needs of a different group of customers. Excellent. Look, I think there's few people that are going to disagree with the statement that, that fintechs tend to right, lead in terms of speed and agility, uh, agility and, and, and right, ID generation and creation to identify right, needs in the market so on and so forth. So, so Kun Chatsri, when, when you look at the work you're doing in, in Bangkok Bank to prepare Bangkok Bank uh, to right, keep pace with FinTech, the culture of FinTech, speed, agility, what are some of the work underway uh, within Bangkok Bank? Uh, to prepare Bangkok Bank to, to compete and partner with the fintechs? We are a large organization, so it's also not an easy process to make internal change. And I think, uh, on the other hand, fintech is quite agile and bring in many uh, fresh ideas. So we like to find ways how to work closely uh, with them. I think both can be beneficial to each other. We can get many good ideas and uh, uh, with a different approach and thinking pattern. At the same time, because of our customer base and uh, certain experience in banking, which could also be beneficial to the fintech. So we start the program, uh, 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 accelerator program, which we call Bangkok Bank InnoHub. Uh, we did it last year, and then uh, this time is also the second time that we are working on. And through that process, we solicited different uh, number of uh, startups, fintech company uh, to come and go through the selection process. And then we also work with them, uh, proof of concept, 
and uh, after the selection process, and then we go through the process of proof of concept and see certain ideas how that, that could be applied and work. At the same time, our people could also learn from the process, the thinking. Uh, at, uh, on the other hand, I think the fintech also learn uh, the banking uh, experience or the banking challenges that we are facing with. Uh, so I think these are th things that we are working on and also it can help us to introduce uh, more change in the organization. Of course, on the other side, we also need to make an internal change. So with new platforms that we are implementing, uh, the new thinking, the uh, thinking process of how to do it on a seamless basis and also uh, make it easy and open for uh, connectivity with uh, other applications to have an open architecture type is also something that we also uh, has been and will be building along the way further. So a combination of both outside in and in, inside out. What's most important is along the way how to change yep. the thinking process of our people and also the challenge of the bureaucracy that we also have to be able to overcome. Like any cultural transformation, it's a journey, <coughs> right? So, so and, and having an incubator within a group clearly is, is, is a power, powerful facilitator. Uh, Tito, you mentioned that you're actually part of an industry movement in the Philippines, right? Tech up. Yeah. So, so, so talk about tech up and, and how an, an entire industry can help transform to compete in a well, case with fintech. I think, I mean, you, you, we started this maybe two, three years ago, and clearly, as you pointed out, the big issue was how do you build trust between these seemingly competing industries when in reality they are symbiotic? And as I said, you know, we're building a strategy out of that. So I think that need, the, the idea of building that ecosystem and participating actively became important in terms of building the collegiality, the trust, and the interaction of ideas in more informal settings, right? So actually, so we have Tech Up Filipinas, which is a movement, and we organize uh, activities around it. We formed, we were a founding member of FinTech Philippines Association, and I'm the chairman of the Blockchain Association of the Philippines. So we did that. Then we also built out um, connections with other associations, with the Indonesian FinTech Association, with Thai, with, uh, and especially with ADCA in Australia, and with other like uh, Commerce, Chamber of Commerce, particularly the Israeli Chamber of Commerce. So in our branch, we have a branch that has an event space. We have Tuesday meetups. So every Tuesday, the startups come to our branch and make presentations. We hold hackathons. We've had 12 uh, hackathons already on different industry verticals, not all banking. The last two were on agri-tech. Agri you know, we've done on real estate, on logistics, supply chain, on uh, autos, on healthcare, on different things that are not specific to banking. The idea being, as uh, Ravi Menon mentioned, that payments are invisible and so, so is credit. So we're interested in both payments and credit being invisible as transactions are being carried out by SMEs, by uh, manufacturers with their back-end supply chain and their front-end distribution chain. So we've had these hackathons. In fact, uh, some of the winners we've hired, we bootstrapped them, and actually they do work. Our convergent app, our mobile banking convergent app, was actually made by a hackathon winner. And they continue to be with us. The second prize winner was a, is doing the testing. And we've gone through maybe 50 iterations since we launched uh, nine months ago. So it's totally on agile. We in the bank, we are moving into an agile organization as ourselves. We're going through that process. We now have uh, over 30 agile teams in, in identified uh, projects. 
where we also use fintechs to think. So our, our interaction, our fintech strategy has, I guess you could say it's like a courtship towards marriage. We start with banking them just as a customer and bank relationship. Then we enable them. We built a very robust API platform. We have 708 APIs. Uh, 137 are published. We get about uh, over 400,000 API calls a day. And so when we meet fintechs, they've got the whole program already sorted out. It's all, all perfect, connected to us, and we're ready to go. So they're, and that's enabling. Then if we really like it, we start investing. And the last part, which is the most difficult, which is why we need to go through a transformation process, is to integrate them. So when it really works out, then it's time to get married. And, and <laughs> this is an example that I just described to you, that this, this hackathon group has now formed themselves into a real corporation. They were young people, and they're blooming on their own. So. It's like a whole program, building trust by being part of an ecosystem. We face the regulators a lot. We work with them. We do the hackathons to create, create such. We actually build platform. If you visit our booth on Hall 4, uh, booth 4F11, you will see four platforms there that we're supporting. One on uh, SME Marketplace, one on a financial institution, rural bank uh, uh, platform on blockchain, uh, a logistic supply uh, chain platform, and a human resources platform. So we're also building this platform. Some are with not only fintechs, but with domain partners, as in the case of uh, logistics and the SME marketplace. So it's a pretty robust uh, interaction in many levels because we've actually formed a group in the bank that reports directly to the CEO uh, that's called the FinTech organization and their job is basically to discover, to, to work with, you know, do this go bank, enable, invest, integrate and the API platform has been a real wonder. I mean, that's heaven sent in terms of really being able to multiply or to leverage your interactions because we know the fail rate is very high with fintechs. So if we're doing things bilaterally, it's not going to happen. And, you know, we support Ravi Menon talked about the AFIN program. We're a pilot bank for that. We think that's a great project. And, uh, I think it's the way to go in terms of really having these hundreds and thousands of uh, connections with fintechs. And in the same way that we have a customer base and we wish to deliver a better customer experience, we also don't want to be too uh, premature in choosing the winners. And I think that's where the API platform uh, really helps the process mm -hmm. yep relationships need work need a lot of work to work uh, right it needs discipline it needs process it needs experience um, but that's not just the relationship of a financial institution with the fintech community right that it wants to partner with often it's also within the group itself right so so kamal when you, when you look at attica which has had a a, a fairly large online digital presence for, for quite a while. Mm. How do you work to, to grow Attica and its online digital offering within the Maybank group? <clears throat> um, uh, we, we, our sales in uh, uh, Malaysia uh, online is about 40, 45 million Sing dollar. In uh, Singapore, we are about 23 million. So there's still some way to go. Uh, but I think it's really, as, as part of a big organization, you know, as part of the Membran Group, it is really about getting, for us to be getting 
comfortable to embrace discomfort. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> The, the fintech are known for agility because you know when you are in a small group, it, it's different. The mindset is different and so on. But you are in a big group. There are layers of uh, approval authority that you need to go through. There's always some uh, business justification that you got to make, and uh, and there's always uh, you know very detailed risk management that you got to go through. So this uh, this makes the the whole process of getting approval uh, very very difficult so that's why i say you know it's about getting comfortable to embrace the this discomfort it's really letting people to run the show and uh, meddle as little as possible which is very difficult to do from uh, people in our position right so let them run you know some people will make mistakes and uh, and learn from the mistakes when that happen and uh, make sure that you know if any mistakes happen is small enough that it doesn't bring down the, the organization so that's that's really how we are you know, preparing ourselves and also to tito what tito mentioned we also try to be agile and so on you know and and really the reality is 100 people trying to work together and you have all these silos everyone is working hard in their own silos but when you come across silos it's, it's just not working as well yeah uh, whereas in a small team, you don't have this uh, this mindset. So how do you move out of this mindset <laughs> and let you know small group of people to be working well together and coming up with all kind of new things and be collaborating with all the fintech and the insure tech as well as they could. So it's, you know, it's a lot really embracing the the discomfort. Agile way of working, small tribes, quick decision making, yeah. right? uh, appetite to fail, uh, building trust. Right? Heard a lot here. Um, Kun Chartri, what are your thoughts on how to select partners uh, in this broadening ecosystem and how to manage your partners for the short, medium, and long term? Of course, we look at the, uh, the capability and the competence of the partners uh, in their respective area and see how that would be able to help and support us and uh, move further. But also another component that is quite important is the, the mindset and the thinking process of that partner because that would also help us to be able to think on the longer term basis, not just only on the transaction uh, basis which might address the short term uh, issue. Uh, because once we start a partnership, we also like to make sure that we could work with uh, that partner for quite a long time to come so that it is a, a true partnership in that respect. The other component we also have to ensure is also uh, if we work with one partner, how to make sure that there is also minimize other conflicts that might potentially have with some others. Uh, but I think this is to ensure that uh, it is, can be a long-term basis. So it is more than just a vendor relationship uh, uh, so that we could grow and work uh, together and be, be beneficial to both sides. Kamal, any thoughts on how to avoid that your partners are seen as vendors within the group? Yeah, you know, it is really about uh, reaching out to as many people as you could I mean, those who can come with this uh, value proposition, eh? mm -hmm. reaching out to as many people as we could, um, and a lot on uh, data usage uh, kind of uh, ideas or technology, and being able to do, you know, it's really about live data, live data, and live data. not just data actually, it's, it's live data that 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 we really, really look forward. Uh, into and then be able to get feedback real time and come back with something new real time as well. So that's really where we are interested in. Uh, you know, I'll be very interested to listen to anyone who can come uh, to me with that uh, proposition. We know that some of this will not, you know, will not work out. Yeah. So probably talk to ten, one or two may actually gain traction. But we accept that, uh, and uh, you know, and for, as a general rule, we don't actually invest 
in a startup. But what we try to offer is the agility despite being a big organization. So that's really, in summary, what we are looking for. So Tito, one of the cliches in, in, in the recent past used to be that fintechs need banks for distribution and banks need fintechs primarily for, for technology. You actually talked earlier about how you partner right, on the distribution side to complement your own distribution as well. So, so where do you see the balance today in terms of who needs whom for what? Um, well, like I say, I mean, we, we sort of have a matrix that we've developed between technology companies, the bank, and fintechs, where we see where there are uh, areas for collaboration. And like I said, not everything fits, one size fits all. So clearly, uh, in fact, in the it's not only fintechs that we partner with, like for example, in the, in the global linker platform that we have in our booth, which is the SME marketplace, we also partner with ERP fintechs, people that provide for the SMEs at a small amount per month, uh, an ERP system or parts of it, HR, inventory management, uh, ARAP, or the whole system, right? So it's clearly not just, so we bring that to the table. The cost, and, and that's one. Number two is the FinTechs are very narrowly focused. You know, they, they do a part, they're a wallet, or they're a specific uh, payment stream out of the different payment streams. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, credit scoring, alternative finance, reg tech, insure tech. Um, but the customer, especially the bigger customers, are multi-product buyers. It's not just open an account. That's a very low value customer for us. So we're interested in multi-product buyers. And we become a natural aggregator for fintechs. So, you know, we, we can choose which fintech, a lending fintech, a, mm -hmm. a, a credit score fintech, a payment fintech, different payment schemes, you know, merchant, bills, you know, fund transfer, wallets, etc. So, I think it's uh, scale, especially on the lending side, they have difficulty scaling and don't have the balance sheet to carry a, uh, a loan book. So we collaborate with that, that you know, they can do origination in an alternative way uh, to the extent that we agree with their algorithm or their, their method of risk assessment, then we can decide to put some of it on our balance sheet. That's a big advantage. It's, I think, a lot more than just a bilateral ch choice between distribution on one hand and technology on the other hand. Like I say, we are also building technology platforms. It's not like we're absent in that mm -hmm. space. Uh, most of it are to digitize our existing banking operations. But we also are doing, like in our particular case, building uh, platforms, um, with, some with technology companies. We've identified actually seven verticals, healthcare, education, um, logistics supply chain, financial institutions, SMEs, uh, used cars, and, and, and real estate, where we're gonna actually build uh, platforms not necessarily with fintechs, the fintechs will, part, but with technology companies and with domain experts, because we don't have domain expertise in those uh, verticals. And as uh, Ravi Menon men mentioned, in all those verticals, why are we getting involved? It's because there's always a payment stream, there's always a lending or credit stream. 
and to the extent that we can make that invisible to the parties and where the platforms need to be neutral because if they're being promoted by a particular industry player, the other industry players will not be interested because of competitive reasons. So a bank can play that role of neutrality, right? Which, which is the role we play today. I mean, we lend to competitors very easily and the competitors know that. So I think in the platform business, to get a lot of participants in, the platform owner has to, should not be in a conflicted uh, position. And I think that's a role the bank can play. And the payback, as, as I said, is the, uh, the payment stream, the invisible payment stream, the invisible uh, credit stream, the invisible insurance uh, stream. Um, in some instances, fintechs are getting a little large and the regulatory burden becomes a little more difficult. So that's also an area where we can take on some of that uh, burden. So it's not, I don't think it's just a choice between better technology here and better distribution there. It, it's, it's quite mm -hmm. complex. And in our case, like I said, we're, we're we're focused on it, it's part of our strat plan, and we've identified the areas where we wanted to be. And then the rest of it, then it's for other people to, to deal with. So we have a very um, con conscious effort on what we want to do based on our purpose, on our value system, on our culture, who we are, why we do things, and uh, the kind of engagement we want with our uh, customer base. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, it was wonderful to have a clear sense of purpose. It's, 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 it's always good to see that recognizing a problem is half the problem solved and recognizing that as an industry, right, we need, we need to collaborate, not compete, to address the needs of the underserved, the underbanked, um, is absolutely critical. And, and we should recognize that there is still a very large, very genuine need of the underbanked, underserved in ASEAN. And I think we should recognize and realize that whilst we've talked a lot about right, disruption taking place in the marketplace, we probably haven't seen anything yet in terms of what it really takes, the real market impact to address right, the needs of the underbanked, the underserved. So, with that said, you can expect that the change we're going to see in the next right, three, five, ten years is going to be a quantum of the change we've seen the last three, four years that we've started to talk about fintech uh, disruptions. So, so Kamal, when you look forward, <laughs> what, what do you see playing out over the coming years in terms of true, genuine disruption in the marketplace? Uh, What's your crystal ball saying? <laughs> uh, I wish uh, I can answer that question very well. Uh, it's, it's hard to tell, but I think it, it should be along the line of what I mentioned earlier, you know. It's, it's about, all about data, life, and be able to respond quickly, almost instantaneously. Eh? So all this, uh, you know, machine learning stuff, artificial intelligence, uh, it's going to come into play a lot more. Um, and, uh, and I think it's going to be along that line. Yeah. Uh, but how exactly is going to play out? You know, uh, I I I have no idea. But it's going to be you know live data, instantaneous feedback, be able to come back uh, out there with uh, something that is useful to the to the members of the public quickly. Kun Chatri, your thoughts on true disruptive tech and and how to prepare Bangkok Bank to compete and. I think it, it is inevitable. Uh, change takes place all the time uh, with the introduction of technology, with the customer experience, as well as the uh, changing uh, requirements. So we have to adopt those changes. And by working with uh, the likes of FinTech, the startups and so forth, also bring new ideas and fresh ideas to the organization. At the same time, we also need to change our organization uh, 
accordingly with uh, new platforms, with organization structure, and also the mindset of the people. So the combination of the two together, I think will be quite inevitable, inevitable and we have to uh, move forward uh, on that basis. So, so Tito, you touched upon the role that regulators play in, in terms of delivering an, an enabling infrastructure, I guess, right? interoperability, real-time payments. Uh, if you move beyond the role of a regulator to make that infrastructure available, how do you see regulators in the Philippines for a start, right? balancing that need for innovation with a desire to maintain a level playing field? Well, our regulator, both the Securities and Exchange Commission and the um, Banco Central, which is our central bank, are actually quite open-minded and very progressive. Now, we interact with them very actively. Our, Banco Cent our SEC, for example, is... Uh, in the comment period right now and, and of uh, issuing ICO guidelines, for example, so token offerings in a regulated environment. Uh, they're also gonna come out with uh, virtual currency exchange rules. So we're already here in the crypto space and you know we're talking about our securities and exchange Commission. Uh, we also have a special economic zone in uh, the north of the Philippines that has its own um, charter under the law, which is also uh, opening for cross-border, so nothing to do, not selling to Filipino investors. The central bank has a unit specifically for uh, I don't know what it's called, I can't remember, but specifically handing fintech and blockchain executions of bank. And we spend a lot of time talking to them. They're, they talk to other regulators like the MAS. Uh, they hire specific uh, people that understand this technology and can interact with the uh, situation. Uh, we're trying to get out of the sandbox. I'm not a big believer of sandboxes. It's kind of, it's maybe a quick sandbox. You know, I mean- you, Rift sand. Yeah, you, you, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a little difficult to get on. So I prefer to go, you know, pilot, make mistakes, pivot, and you know, just carry on. Because we're not talking of anything that's a systemic risk which is really the principal uh, mandate of the, of the regulator. And I think that that, that uh, communication um, with the regulator, especially on issues that are uh, related to financial inclusion, where you can't have a very cumbersome or difficult onboarding process or application process or, or transaction fulfillment process, um, I think it's understood. But it requires a lot of conversation, a lot of visioning, a lot of uh, relating what you're doing into a, um, into a uh, strat plan. So we, for example, have just set up a uh, corporate venture capital business, and we had to get that through the regulator to invest in this so what they call non-allied undertakings. So all of these platforms that I just mentioned to you have nothing to do with banking directly. It took a while, but they understood how this fits into our strategy. So that's the principal question they always ask. How does this fit into your strategy? If you can explain that and you can justify it, we'll look at it. And that's been the process. It's always how does it fit into the strategy and don't get us into any systemic risk, which right now is early days 
nothing is of real scale. Uh, it's it's a big sandbox rather than this. Excellent. It little, certainly is little Look, one. It's a big sandbox, and I think it's it's, it's very encouraging to hear that um, the regulator in the Philippines is 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 so. Right? Proactive and, and, and embracing the, the discussion and, and the issues. It's widely known that the MAS is, is right here to support fintech and innovation, but to hear that it's actually taking hold with regulators across the ASEAN region is, is personally making me very hopeful that we will make meaningful progress mm. in the coming years to address the needs of the right, underserved, underbanked. Final question for, for, for you, my friend Kamal. So, 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 so once machines have taken over, uh. Etica and the operations in Etica. How are you going to differentiate yourself going forward in the client experience that Etica provides? You know, the, there are things that currently being done by human that we don't really want to do. Right? I mean, all those uh, repetitive stuff and so on. So I think uh, what's going to happen is just, you know, this uh, repetitive stuff is going to be done by, by machine. But humans are capable of doing many things that only humans can do. Yeah? Like maybe loving the customers really well. Yeah? Well, I don't know. I mean, probably we haven't seen any machine that can really love humans that well. But, but probably we are getting there. But still, you know, there will be some time before we can reach, we, we reach there. So what we are seeing is uh, repetitive stuff goes to a machine, uh, there's a little bit of maybe decision that can be made by machine, uh, especially you know, in terms of claims payment, yeah, in terms of claims assessment, uh, in terms of fast tracking uh, claim payment. Uh, but when it comes to dealing with uh, human beings, making them feel really like human beings, I think these are where you know, our staff will be more, more focused on. And then, of course, the, the higher level, more technical stuff, they're going to be doing all the artificial intelligence uh, uh, work. Yeah. Very good. There is a bright red light flashing in front mm -hmm. of us, so, so I believe that we have reached the end of our session. I'm not sure there's still time to take one or two questions from the audience, but um, if, if there isn't, I, I hope you... You found it useful. Uh, it's clear to me that right, collaboration and partnership is the only way forward, as is the importance of having a regulatory framework and infrastructure that supports FinTech and FIs coming together. Uh, in that light, let me just leave you uh, to, um, with reminding you that, that, that as Ravi Manon mentioned this, this morning, Right? Singapore and the MAS in conjunction with IFC is about to launch the API exchange, right. which, which is a massive step forward, uh, not just for Singapore, <laughs> but for ASEAN to drive financial inclusion by providing a platform and not just the sandbox for, for FIs and fintechs to come together. So if you haven't familiarized yourself already, with the APIX initiative, please do so over the coming uh, few days. That they have a, a booth here. I know that some of the panelists are, are active pilot participants of the API exchange. And uh, thank you for coming out today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.